on Wednesday as well. So last time we started talking about poral elasticity, um, mainly we have these three assumptions that there's an interconnected pore system, uh, that the total volume of the pore system is small compared to the rock, and that the pore pressure, the total stress, and the stress, uh, you know, total stress externally and the total stress on the grains are statistically defined, which basically just means that we can use averages, that there's a separation of link scales so that we can use homogenization or averages, okay? And then we ha defined this uh, basically effective stress and we and I gave two definitions. Um, the, the classic Terzaghi definition, which is the one we've just been using, that it's the, uh, basically the, the total stress tensor minus, um, I'm not sure, I thought of this, uh, I don't know if it's not just not showing up or maybe I, I didn't put it on there, but there should be some indication that this is an effective stress. Sometimes we use a single kind of prime symbol for that and, and possibly a double prime for this one. I think that I had them there, maybe they're just not showing up on the screen for some reason. Um, so you have the total stress minus the pore pressure, and the pore pressure only acts hydrostatically. So we just subtract it from basically the diagonal entry since the identity matrix there. And then in this exact effective stress, we have this extra coefficient right here, and this thing is called the BO's coefficient. And I just want to uh, sort of go over where that comes from or how, how we come up with that. It, um, it, it shows up a lot and it's important, particular, particularly in shales and hard rocks. Uh, in in s unconsolidated sands, it's typically about one, so it, it recovers the Terzaghi definition. But for shales and other sort of hard, harder rocks, uh, it, it can be, you know, two-thirds around that value or something like that. So uh, I'm going to go over the derivation of that, okay? The derivation is probably a little bit beyond the, you know, it's, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class. I mean, I'm certainly not going to ask you any test questions about the derivation, but since you'll see it so often, I do want to show you where it comes from and that it's not just, you know, magical. Uh, so, in our poor elasticity model. Right, we have our sort of characteristic volume of material, and now the material has pores in it. Right. Of course, I've drawn these pores much larger than they actually are, given our assumption that the pore volume is small. Right. And so we have some external stress that's going to be acting on this guy. And we'll just call that P. Right? And then we also have a pore pressure, we'll call P. <coughs> and the pore pressure acts normal to all faces of any pore. So that's also P. So if we look at a little characteristic piece of material right here. Right? So we're going to take this material that's completely solid, right? So so this is sort of a structure or a system, right? It's it's the solid material plus the pores. But this little black area I, I colored in, that's just the solid material, right? That's just rocks. There's no there's no pore there, okay? So if we if we pull that out and sort of look at it characteristically, it's also going to have an external stress on it. And what's it going to be equal to? What's the external stress on, on this little piece of solid material that I've pulled out from my, from my skeleton here? Well, if this is P and that's P, 
when this is in equilibrium, it's not moving, what is that, what is the confining stress on that little piece going to be? What's it going to be? No. I'm, I'm, I've got an externally applied stress of P. There's an internally applied stress from the pores of P. The thing's in equilibrium. So what would the stress on that be? No, it's not zero. It's, it's P, right? If I'm I'm pushing on the outside of something. So e quite frankly, even if the pores weren't there, right? If, if, I'm put, if I have a piece of homogeneous material and I apply an external stress of P, and then I cut out any little piece of that material, it, the, the stress on it is also going to be P, right? Well, the pores, the, okay, so even if the pores weren't there. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter for the argument I'm going to make. <clears throat> so, so that's also P, right? So if we write, well, <clears throat> we haven't really done this, but we can take any stress tensor, and I'm going to use this initial notation that I introduced when we talked about constitutive models. So I and J are just indices that go from 1 to 3, right? So if they go from 1 to 3, then there's nine components total, okay? So the stress can be decomposed into a deviatoric stress plus an isotropic stress. And the decomposition is like this. And again, this is sort of where, why I said that the, this derivation is beyond the, sort of beyond the scope of this class, because I, I introduced some notation that is not real familiar, um, and, and it's, it's called Einstein additional notation. And specifically, what's sort of unique about it is that anytime you have a repeated indice in the product of a term, like you know, so this is, you know, the product of one third that thing and that thing. Anytime you have a repeated indice, an, uh, an indice that appears twice, that's the same thing. Uh, it's, it's just a shorthand for this notation. So it's just shorthand for a summation. So Einstein actually introduced this notation. That anytime you have a repeated indice, you, you just you don't want to carry around all these summation terms all the time. So you just drop said, oh, anytime there's a repeated indice, we're just going to drop that thing. So since this is re repeated, what that really means, sigma sigma kk is equal to one one two two three three. So I have this stress that, I haven't told you what this deviatoric stress is yet, but it, it, so I have the, the stress is the sum of the deviatoric stress plus the isotropic stress. So the deviatoric stress is the stress associated with shears, and the isotropic stress is the stress associated with hydrostatic pressure. Right? And in my example here, in my example right there, right? There is no deviatoric stress. I'm, I'm equally confining this little cube by P on all sides. So I'm not inducing any shear. I'm just squeezing it equally on all sides. Right? Shear would imply some type of transverse deformation. Right? I'm just squeezing it equally on all sides. That's an isotropic deformation. And so in this case, this is just zero. Is zero, and uh, so this. So I don't make a mistake in my notes. I, I'm gonna, you know, 
what we're doing here is deriving what alpha is, okay? So for, this, for the moment, for the sake of this derivation and this derivation only, we're going to assume tension positive. Tension positive. Uh, in the, you know, normally in the rest of the class we'll assume the compression positive, but for this derivation only we're going to assume tension positive. Um, and so, so in the way I have it drawn, P is clearly a compressive stress, right? So in the tension positive scheme, that's actually minus P. Right? Uh, so anyway, ultimately what what we what we have here is that. We're going to define the pressure as one third sigma kk delta ij. And I think last time I, I told you what delta ij is. It's, it's this thing, it's called a Kronecker delta. So when, when i equals j, it's one. Uh, when i not equal to j, it's zero. When i not equal to j. Zero. Okay, so it, it's sort of like the identity matrix. So if it, if you think of these tensors as three by three matrices, this just implies that one's along the diagonal. Right. Okay, so we we have the the pressure is this guy, and therefore if we if we plug that back into plug this back here where this is zero, then we have that sigma ij is equal to minus p delta ij. Right. Now when we talked about linear elasticity, we had, I gave you, that th there's this formula, it was at the bottom, you remember we, we sort of talked about the big C matrix for isotropic linear elasticity. Uh, but at the bottom of that page in the notes, there was a formula that was like the stress tensor is equal to lambda times the trace of the strain tensor times the identity matrix plus 2 mu <coughs> times the strain tensor, where lambda is Lemay's constant, mu is the shear modulus. And of course, these are, these are just elastic constants of which, for an isotropic material, you can pick any two, right? And so that this is how I wrote it in that uh, slide. But in this initial notation we're using here, that would just be sigma ij is equal to lambda epsilon kk delta ij plus 2 mu epsilon ij. Right. So this is sort of, this is the, initial notation version of that. All right. And lambda is equal, and this is just straight off of that chart which relates all the elastic constants. Lambda is equal to the bulk modulus minus two-thirds the shear modulus. And so if I plug that in, I have K, sigma KK, delta IJ, minus 2 mu, one-third, sigma KK, delta IJ, plus 2 mu. And if I rearrange that, then I get K, So if you look at this term here, it's like the total strain minus one-third the trace of the strain tensor times the identity matrix. 
Compare that to the stress, and remember stress and strain are re related linearly, right? So compare that to the way I defined this, right? I said the total stress is equal to some deviatoric thing that's zero plus the isotropic thing. Well, if I take that and I subtract it over there, right, then I have the total stress minus this isotropic thing is equal to the deviatoric thing. And the deviatoric thing is zero. So if you compare those terms, maybe I'll just write it out. If I just rearrange this equation, what I have is S deviatoric, which is equal to zero, is equal to the total stress minus one-third sigma KK <coughs> delta IJ. Okay. So this is zero. So just look at the look at the comp compare that to that, and keep in mind that stress and strain are related linearly. So if if this is the deviatoric stress, then you might call this the deviatoric strain. And if the deviatoric stress is zero, then the deviatoric strain is also going to be zero. Right. So this whole term is zero. So then I'm going to take this guy, plug it in there. So I have minus P delta IJ is equal to K sigma KK delta IJ. The delta IJs cancel, and ultimately, if I solve that, I have sigma KK is equal to minus P over K. And what I'm going to write a little subscript on my K I'm going to give it a subscript S because this is the bulk modulus of the solid material, right? Obviously, if I consider the, the material as a whole, the solid material plus the pores, which we sometimes call the solid skeleton, because it's got the pores in there. Remember, the bulk modulus is the material's inherent resistance to compression, right? So it should be intuitively obvious that if I take a piece that's completely solid and I squeeze it, it's going to be stiffer than if I take the whole thing with the, with the pores in there and squeeze it. Is that intuitive? No? Because, I mean, you know, here you're having to compress solid material. Here you're comp compressing solid material plus some fluid inside, which is more compressible than the solid. Okay, so um, so our if we go back and write down the total strain tensor again, write our equation. The total strain is equal to some deviatoric strain plus one third sigma KK delta IJ. And this is zero, then we have that the total strain <coughs> of the solid is equal to minus the pore pressure over three K of the solid delta IJ. And that that comes from just substituting for sigma KK the relationship we just derived for the solid material. All right. That just comes from Plug in that. For that. Right. Okay. So that was all just based on the solid material. So now let's go back and consider our skeleton material. So now we're going to consider the solid 
plus the pores. And how it might deform. So we had this generalized Hooke's law that said that stress is equal to C um, C I J K L epsilon K L. So again, I've dropped the I've dropped the summations, but there would be, since the K and the L are repeated, there would be two summations out here over K equals 1 to 3 and L equals 1 to 3. Again, you won't be tested on this derivation. Um, so you sort of have to take my word for it, but we can invert this relationship. In other words, we can solve for epsilon KL, and we'll, we'll, what we'll call that is that D K L I J sigma I J, where D is sort of C inverse. So we just solved this equation, and then instead of carrying around the inverse, we just want to call that D. <coughs> so then the total strain. In, in our skeleton, epsilon KL is equal to D KL IJ times the stress, and we're going to use our uh, effective stress model. And here's where my tension, so this is the effective stress. By the way, I, I should have mentioned that these this C, I, J, K, D, these things are material properties, right? They're, this is a matrix of material properties, okay? So in the, in, the, in the isotropic case, this would just be a matrix that contained essentially two independent quantities, Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, and pick your favorite two, right? This is just the material properties. But uh, what I should have said is it's the material properties of the entire skeleton, right? So if you go to the lab, and you measure the rock system, the rock plus the pores, right? Which is really the only way you can measure it. You know, it's very hard. You know, rock is just made up of a bunch of sediments, right? So you'd, you'd have to essentially test like pure quartz, right, or something like that to test uh, what, you know, what any individual gr grain is, okay? So since it's the, since it's the uh, material properties of the skeleton, right, of the system, then this is where our effective, so the stress is really our effective stress. And then before I defined effective stress with a minus sign right here, it's because I was using a compression positive sign convention. For the purposes of this derivation only, I'm using a tension positive sign compression, so there's a plus there. Right. Okay, so. So this is the total strain. You know, if I go to the lab and I squeeze this thing, just ap apply loads, and I measure the strain, just like I have it drawn there, I have that. That's the total strain, OK? But there's also going to be some strain due to any strain in the solid material, and we already solved for that. It's up here. So then we're going to have minus one-third Ks P delta Ij. Right. So this is the strain of the skeleton minus any strain that's in the solid material only. And that's the total strain. Okay. So, so now we're going to introduce our exact effect, effective stress. And so we're going to say that 
the exact effective stress is equal to sigma ij plus alpha p delta ij. So now we have introduced this alpha. And that's equal to c ij kl. Again, this is the material properties of the, of the skeleton times epsilon kl. Now we have an expression for epsilon kl, so we're going to say c ij kl times d kl ij sigma ij plus p delta ij minus one third ks p delta ij. And so since c and d are inverses, so, you know, so since d is defined as c inverse, if I multiply these aren't matrices, they're tensors, but the same rule applies here. If I multiply a matrix by its inverse, what do I get? The identity matrix, okay? Same thing applies here. If I, if I multiply this fourth order tensor by its inverse, I get the fourth order identity tensor, okay? So this skipping some steps, C times D then just gets you sigma IJ plus C IJ KL P delta IJ minus D K S P And over here on this side, I'm just grabbing this. So it's delta ij plus alpha p ij. Uh, I'm sorry, so uh, sigma ij. So, si so you can see on both sides of the equation, there's a sigma ij. So they cancel. And now every term that remains has a p in it. So they cancel. Then I can multiply both sides of the equation by delta ij. So if I multiply delta ij, delta ij, remember I multiply by delta ij. Remember I have, it's really, this is really, now you have repeated i's and repeated j's. So this is the sum over i, sum over j times this Kronecker delta thing which is 1 when i equals to j. You can work it out if you want, but what you'll see is when you take that summation, this becomes 3. Right. So this is, this thing here is 3, and this thing here is 3, and so ultimately when you work it out, you get alpha is equal to 1 minus delta ij, c i j k l uh, delta k l over nine k s. Okay. And we're almost done. If the material is isotropic then this term becomes 9 lambda plus 6 mu over 9. And turns out, if you look that up in the table of uh, material property relations, 9 lambda plus 6 mu over 9, it turns out that that is equal to k 
k, the bulk modulus, right? k. And remember, I said that this Cijkl is the material properties of the solid skeleton, right? So this is the k of the solid skeleton. Or sometimes you might, we might say that that's kT for total. So it's the total bulk modulus of the solid plus the pores. Right? And so then if you look at what this, this equation becomes, ultimately 1 minus kT over kS. That's what alpha is equal to for an isotropic material. I think there should be a parenthesis here. Anyway. Um, so for an, for an isotropic material, this is what alpha is equal to. So you remember what I said that for an unconsolidated sand, it's approximately one. Right? Think about that. And, and th what is sand made of? Quartz. So if you were to go into the lab and test the bulk modulus of quartz, this would be a very, very big number. So if you have a very big number, and if you were to go to the lab and you test the bulk modulus of a, you know, a million grains of sand, you squeeze those, and you measure the bulk modulus, it's going to be a number that's much, much smaller than. So the total bulk modulus, in other words, the way sand behaves as a bulk, as a, as a continuum, right? As if you pack a thousand sand grains or a million sand grains and you test those, of course they're going to move past each other. There's going to be lots of space in there, right? So, so that material, that's going to be a number that's much, much smaller than that number, and therefore this is approximately going to be zero, and therefore one would be what's left, and, and therefore for sand, un unconsolidated sand, uh, one is a good approximation. So I think that just says what I just said. Uh, for sand, the, 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 you know, the bulk modulus of the solid and the bulk modulus of the sand is going to be much greater than the total bulk modulus, so alpha is approximately 1. For rocks, shales, and other things, it's not uncommon to have a value around 2 thirds. So here's a here's a plot that actually shows some real experimental data for BO's coefficient as a function of pressure. So you can see that this isn't constant, and this has to do with the fact that usually the bulk modulus is not truly a constant. Right? Um, so for sands, you see numbers at low pressures, approximately one and reducing some for higher pressures. Essentially, that, that's also intuitive, I think. If you have a bunch of sand and you compact it together first, right, you, you squeeze it together, it's sort of squeezing out all the, the looseness, right? The air, if you will, it becomes a more dense material before you then you know, measure, try to attempt to measure the bulk modulus, right? So essentially, you're getting, you know, continued densification here. That, that's also true of other rocks and other things because you're, you're squeezing out the pore space. 